Episodes of the Green Corn Rebellion show are sponsored by Oklahoma Progress Now. Oklahoma Progress Now is a 501c4 organization focused on building progressive power in Oklahoma. Their primary efforts are on developing progressive content for a 21st century audience, coalition, and capacity building across progressive organizations and causes, and working to see elected leaders who are more responsive to their constituents and the needs of the many. Areas of focus include progressive messaging and communications, coalition building and resource sharing, and focused progressive policy goals. You can check out their Twitch live streams, and they go uh, live on Facebook on at noon, Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Please support this organization. It's a really great organization. It's just getting started here in Oklahoma. Uh, thank you. Now enjoy the rest of the video. Hello, this is the Green Corn Rebellion Show, and today I'm here with State Senator Carrie Hicks, who represents District 40 in the Oklahoma State Legislature. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me on. Welcome. Uh, so first question I have here is where are you from and where did you grow up? Could you tell me a little bit about your upbringing? Sure. Um, I was raised in Bartlesville, um, Oklahoma, and actually we live just outside of Bartlesville <laughs> in between um, Barnstall and Bartlesville. So my um, family is all kind of concentrated in the northeast corner of the state. Um, and I, I grew up um, there and went to Bartlesville High School. And um, shortly after, I earned a full scholarship to Oklahoma City. And so I laid down some roots at Oklahoma City University. And um, unfortunately, don't get back as often as I should. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. Um, what made you end up becoming a teacher? Yeah, so my father was a teacher as well, um, and he taught in Bartlesville Public Schools for many years. He retired after 32 years in the classroom, and I had, you know, obviously enjoyed helping him set up his classroom year to year, um, but it was a financial struggle for our family uh, because, you know, he wasn't earning very much uh, either at the time. And my mother worked in oil and gas, and so she was the breadwinner for our family. And so I had, you know, tried to ultimately run away <laughs> from the calling uh, to carry on the legacy of being in the classroom. Um, so after, you know, I graduated with my um, undergrad in uh, political science and in mass communications, I, I worked in nonprofit for a while, and then I just, you know, finally... Um, decided that I, I knew my heart was in the classroom and that's where I belonged. And so I got my teaching certificates and never looked back. That's great. Um, that's cool. Um, I'm currently going to school to become a history teacher. So. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. I love that. I'm certified to teach um, history <laughs> 6 through 12, but I've never actually taught it in the classroom. But I'm That's cool. Uh, so what made you run for the state senate? Yeah, I mean, it was those those years inside of the classroom that really just became um, compounding, if you will, in that, you know, I had been taking personal days for years from the classroom to to go to the Capitol and meet with individuals about the struggles that we were facing um, and about the lack of resources that our schools were equipped with. And um, ultimately, you know, my my plea was just that our kids deserve the resources they need to be successful. And by the legislature not funding um, our our classroom expenses at an at a competitive rate, you know, the kids are the ones that are paying the cost um, for for our short sighted investment. And after I think it was almost four years of going to the state capitol and leaving frustrated and feeling as though those concerns were going unmet, um, I decided that I could I could either leave um, like many of my colleagues had already um, or, you know, I could I could stop caring <laughs> um, or I could put my name on the ballot and run for office to try and do something about it. And so I I took a leap of faith um, 
and just ultimately knew that my background in political science had uh, very well prepared me to understand the inner workings of the building um, and my classroom experiences really shape the way in which, um, you know, I hope to make uh, really meaningful long-term policy. All right, cool. Um, could you tell me about some of the accomplishments that you've been proud of since you've been at the Capitol? <laughs> Oh, man. Um, my time in the legislature has been interesting. Um, let's just say the very first session um, in the super minority um, and a freshman legislator, I was able to pass a piece of legislation that I'm very proud of called Kevin's Law. And um, it was, you know, unanimous in committee and in both the Senate and on the floor of the house. And so that's just a really, really um, proud accomplishment for me personally. It provides for emergency access to life-saving medicines. And so my son having type 1 diabetes and knowing um, the frustrations that we often face in um, making sure we have adequ adequate supplies on hand uh, to treat and manage his chronic illness, um, it was pretty um frustrating to think that not everyone would have emergency access to their life-saving medications if they needed to. So it was named after Kevin um, out of Ohio who had actually passed away because he was unable to get a supply of insulin as a type 1 di um, diabetic and um, passed away over the New Year's holiday uh, because the pharmacy was closed. All right. Um <clears throat> What are some things you'd like to see get passed or be addressed at the Capitol in the future? So this might be my favorite question <laughs> <laughs> because I'm a dreamer and I'm an optimist. And so even when things feel very heavy and I mean, there are a lot of really, really um, troubling situations that we have found ourselves in currently as a state. Um, but I continue to believe in our people. And so I'm just um, continuing to look for ways to bring uh, people in on the conversations that are are happening and are shaping policy. Um, one of the things that I've been working um, pretty much around the clock on um, since this all happened, you know, kind of melds the two um, passions that I have, which are on healthcare and on um schools. And so how do we, in the midst of a global pandemic, how do we adequately ensure that kids are safe in a school setting? And do they have any medical per personnel on staff? Um, and if they don't have a full-time nurse at the school site, does the school district have collaborations or partnerships there in the community? Um, and, you know, if if you can believe this, 70% of our school districts currently do not have any um, full-time or part-time staff um, that are medically trained. And so that's very concerning, um, you know, and it, it should be concerning to most individuals to think that um, our schools aren't adequately staffed to be able to handle the challenges um, that we're currently facing right now with a global pandemic. All right. Um, how do you feel about the passage of State Question 802 earlier this summer? You know, I think it was a really really positive and um, bright spot for me personally. Um, you know, the, the data and the evidence has overwhelmingly shown the state of Oklahoma how different our health outcomes could have been and will be um, now with the passage of uh, Medicaid expansion. Um, you know, the, the that's the great news, right, is that we passed it as a state, the people voted on it, and they agreed that you know, it was unacceptable to have the second highest um, adult population of uninsured individuals in the country. You know, it was unacceptable um, that people who are, are working full time and not provided insurance coverage through their employers were going without. Um, it's just unacceptable. And so I'm so, I'm thankful um, that 802 passed. Um, my, my concern now is that it is implemented well. <laughs> and so there's been the, the conversations and, you know, some of the obstacles I think that we, we anticipate are that the governor's team has um, pretty well made it known that they want managed care. And, you know, I was open-minded to the idea and the conversations, and we're still continuing to have those conversations. Um, but 
the outcomes in our you know neighboring state, let's just say of Kansas, um, they moved to a managed care model recently. And I mean, they've increased their um, per person expenditure and their health outcomes have actually gone down. So I, I just, you know, really question where this push for managed care is coming from if we know that we're going to be um, really, really tight for resources and dollars because of the economic recession that we are facing. Um, you know, I just have a lot of questions about whether or not that's the best decision for our state at this time. All right. Um, <clears throat> and how are you feeling about the handling of the pandemic by the governor and the schools in Oklahoma City and the mayor of Oklahoma City? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> That's a loaded question. Um, no, I, um, you know, I've, I've been very disappointed at the lack of leadership at the state level. Um, and let me just, you know, be very clear in saying that I do believe in local control. And I do believe that um, we need to, you know, be very careful and cautious of the way in which um, state government overreaches into some of those local decisions that should be made on a on a case by case basis. Um, but when we're in the midst of a global pandemic that's not just impacting Oklahoma City or the state of Oklahoma or the country of the United States of America, um, it really, truly involves a community response. And this plea to individualism about individuals taking personal responsibility for their actions is not a well-researched nor scientific approach to public health. And so it's it's been very disappointing that even from the federal guidance that we've been receiving, it's falling on it's falling on um, leaders that definitely don't agree with a state mandate for masks. And that's I'm so sorry. It's <laughs> okay. Um, you know, and and listen, I understand the argument of, you know, if if there if the majority of the outbreak is concentrated in Oklahoma City and Oklahoma County or Tulsa and Tulsa counties, then why do I in a very rural area have to comply with a mask mandate? Um, but people are mobile. <laughs> you know, they don't just stay in their um cities or their municipalities were constantly moving about. Um, and so, you know, it's, in my opinion, had we really taken the shutdown seriously and instituted all of the best practices that we know would have mitigated and contained the transmission of the virus, um, you know, we wouldn't be in the situation that we're currently experiencing. I'm thankful to our mayor. Mayor Holt has been, um, you know, easier to work with and absolutely um, had had some difficult decisions, which again, you know, since our state leadership who has access to the state health department and all of the experts that we have at the state level who are drawing very nice salaries, um, you know, they're not passing that information along to the local municipalities. And so I think it's unfair. I mean, you're playing with the unfair um, deck of cards when you don't have all the pieces of information that you should have in order to make the best decisions for your community. So that's truly where my frustration is, is just that if we're not, if we're not going to increase our information sharing for everyone to be able to make those decisions, then we need those decisions to be made at the state level. All right. Uh, last question I have here is what kind of music do you listen to? <laughs> everything <laughs> who are some of your favorites who are some of your favorite music artists at least yeah well I mean you know first and foremost Beyonce is just the absolute best way to wake up in the morning my kids um are really into Post Malone um we also um love Lizzo um those are just a few of our favorite artists but we we love to have the house filled with music um we have nightly dance parties <laughs> <laughs> Um, because I just believe that music is good for the soul. That's good. Uh, thank you for coming on. It means a lot for you to come on. Uh, where can we find you on social media? Absolutely. You can reach me at hicks 4 ok the number four, um, on both Twitter and Instagram. It's the same, Hicks4OK. Number 
O-K. Um, and then on Facebook, it's Senator Carrie Hicks. Um, and I just so appreciate the conversation and the dialogue. Um, you know, it is truly one of the most challenging yet rewarding careers I've ever had <laughs> in politics. <laughs> um, but it is truly never a dull moment. Um, the good news is even when, um, you know, the, the headlines seem overwhelming, there are still individuals like myself who are committed to the work and making sure that people are heard in the conversation. All right. It was nice talking to you. <laughs> you as well. I'm okay. sorry about the background noise. <laughs> it's all right.